Hey there, it's Andrea and welcome to the Voice of Influence podcast. Today I have with me Kelly Campbell. Kelly speaks and writes about trauma, leadership, and consciousness, the new TLC. The author of Heal to Lead, Kelly is a trauma-informed leadership coach to emerging and established leaders who know that they are meant for more. Kelly's vision is for more than half of humanity to heal its childhood trauma so that we may reimagine and rebuild the world together. Wow. What a statement and welcome to the podcast, Kelly Campbell. It's all true. Thanks for having me, Andrea. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah. So half the world healing from childhood trauma so we can rebuild the world together. Tell me what kind of is behind that statement. There's so much there. Yeah. So, um, this is really like a personal mission and I know it feels very big and audacious, but I believe that where we are in the world today is really rooted in the unresolved and unprocessed, unintegrated trauma that we've all experienced, right? None of us had a perfect childhood, even the people who have not had any experience with ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences that are kind of the big T trauma that we think about. Even if we've had none of those particular experiences, we've definitely had some small T trauma that we've experienced, maybe even on a continuous basis. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, could look like abandonment, feelings of rejection, humiliation, betrayal, things along those lines. And those things essentially cut at our true nature would be the way that I would say it. Um, they create false narratives for us and they make us create stories about ourselves that we are not inherently valuable or worthy. And then if we don't do the work to clean that up, we project our pain on everyone else. And I think that's really the basis, very blanket statement, but that's the basis for where we are in the world right now. I see that on uh, the world stage, political leaders. I also think that it has a lot to do with the, the way that we have treated our environment and why we're in the climate crisis that we're in. So yeah, it is a, an audacious mission. Um, and I don't necessarily think that I will see that mission through in my lifetime, but if I can be part of contributing to that, that feels good enough for me. Um, I'd like to join you in that mission. <laughs> I got um, another one. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. It is definitely part of what is going on here as well. And so that's one of the reasons why I've been really looking forward to talking to you about your book, mm -hmm. because I definitely feel like this message has to get out there more and more and more. And it has been, I mean, I think over the past decade or so, mental health trauma, these, these have become more top of mind for people, a little mm -hmm. less stigmatized, I guess, than they had been, but yet there's so much education to be done. Even if people have heard the word enough, they don't necessarily know what to do about it. Yeah. Um, so thank you for taking the time and energy to, to write, heal, to lead. Um, I'm curious what got you into talking about healing from trauma in the first place. So as you can imagine, anyone who's talking about this must have some firsthand experience. And so the way that I grew up, um, I had lived for the first 16 years of my life with a mother who had um, comorbidity conditions, so borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. I didn't know what those things were when I was younger. I just kind of thought something was off. But also this was my mother, right? This is one of my primary caregivers. So instead of questioning um, all the time whether this was true or not, or something was really wrong with her. Um, I really, I just turned that inward. And I thought, well, I wonder what's wrong with me that I'm not lovable enough that she can't care for me or nourish or nurture me in ways that I saw other mothers, you know, nurturing their children. So that's what we do, right? Yeah. I've, I've heard mm -hmm. that before too. Yeah. Yeah. So the work of Dr. Gabor Mate, I mean, the what how he sort of encapsulates that is it's easier for us to, to turn that inward and think we must be the broken, the damaged, you know, the the unhealed one or the wounded one, um, maybe even irreparably damaged. That's to the extent that we think about that when we're younger. Because if it's really our environment, our caregivers and things like that, um, how can we ever feel safe if the environment that we're growing up in is 
the broken damage thing. Like I must be the broken damage thing. And so that's why we really create those, those internal narratives that become the blueprints and the, and the foundation for how we show up as adults, whether that's in our personal lives, leadership roles, you name it. Mm, yeah. Mm. You know, um, I know that like you were talking about big T trauma, little T trauma. I wonder if there's a middle T trauma. <laughs> Um, because while the things that I experienced personally, um, like I, I wrote a book, uh, that was a memoir and it was a lot about just that something that I think a lot of people go through, which is kind of trying to figure out who you are, this identity kind of stuff and how you fit into the world, that kind of stuff. But then, um, experiencing some sort of trauma in like I, I was around 30, 30 years old or so when I had a sec, my second child and, and had an experience that was very difficult. And, um, and then it took me a few years to get over it. And it definitely, the things like I would imagine, like if I, if I thought of myself in the hospital, I would automatically curl up into a ball, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, uh, and so there's, I think there's also, there's also these people who are saying, well, maybe it wasn't my parents or maybe of course there was, I, all of us have issues with our parents, but then there's also these other things that come along the way. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, what we're talking about is kind of two different things, okay. childhood trauma, right? Yeah. Pretty much zero to 14. Some people even say zero to 24 depends on who you're following and, and, you know, how they're couching that. But I think most people would uh, really think about this as zero to 14. And that's what we kind of think about with uh, adverse childhood experiences. So those yeah. ACEs. And then let's call it 24, just for argument's sake, from 24 to however we old, uh, however old we are now, there's lots and lots of things that can happen. You know, life does a great job at lifing. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's in the workplace, our romantic relationships, our friendships, um, accidents that happen, illnesses that happen, deaths that happen. Mm -hmm. Those are all experiences that can be quite traumatic. Um, trauma, just to highlight that or to mm -hmm. find that a little bit better. Trauma is not about the event, right? That, that we have experienced. It's what happens inside of us because of or due to the event yeah. that we've experienced. And so, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily understand that trauma doesn't have to be a stigmatized word. It doesn't have to be this big thing. Uh, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It's really about the unintegrated energy and information that we don't know what to do with, right? So trauma also lives in the body. We know that from the work of Dr. Bessel van der Kolk and, and other folks, right? Mm -hmm. And so if it lives in the body, if it's stored in the body, literally our muscles, our tissues, our DNA, our fascia, parts of the body that really hold on to those um, emotional encodings, maybe we'll call them, mm -hmm. we have to do the somatic work to actually release them and get them out of our body. Otherwise, we develop chronic illness, mental health conditions, you know, lots of different things that um, feel very, very uncomfortable and can be quite debilitating. Mm. Okay. So you said this is that we're talking about a couple different things. Can you help me to understand, help the audience understand too, like the, what is actually different? So you're saying like the the healing, the healing to lead piece that you're bringing to the table is more about the childhood trauma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And yet I will, I will just chime in with a, and I bet it would help everybody <laughs> to some degree as well, because a lot of the things that you're talking about certainly are important. Yeah. And totally applicable. You know, yeah. some of the things that we experience in childhood, we think that we've gotten past them. We think that we've sort of, um, I don't know come to a place of acceptance with them and healed, right? Past tense. Mm -hmm. But then something happens in adulthood that feels eerily similar to that thing that happened. And we wonder why we have this reaction. Well, it wasn't, it's not healed. I mean, that's how we know that that kind of never happens. There's no mm -hmm. healed in the past tense. Healing work is a lifetime commitment. It's ongoing work. 
Um, that might feel really daunting to some people, but that's exciting to me because every time it comes around in a different form or a different flavor, it's like, oh, well, now I'm getting more of this information. So there's more integration to do, right? That's exciting to me, not because I love trauma, but because I love, I'm a sponge and I love information, right? And so if there are new ways in which I can think about how I'm showing up or behaving or thinking, that means that I'll get more information to help other people think in those new ways. So that's why it's exciting to me. And is that, is that what you're talking about when you use the word integration? So integration, yeah, it's really like if we think about trauma as these these parts that are unprocessed, right? We haven't really dealt with them. They're parts of us, right? But if we have lots and lots of parts of us that aren't talking to each other, right? Lots of parts of us that that make up our composition, but that are not coming together, then that's why we feel a sense of like disconnection inside mm -hmm. of ourselves. We feel maybe uncomfortable in our own skin. Mm -hmm. People say like, um, I want to trust my intuition. I want to trust my gut, but it's hard for me to do that. Those are some of the ways in which that manifests, that sort of unintegrated trauma will help us or, or you know, cause us to not feel like we can trust ourselves and we feel comfortable in our own skin and, you know, all of those types of things. So yeah, integration is, like I said, it's, it's a lifelong commitment. That's a really good word. <laughs> Um, how does a person know that it's time for them to take a step back and consider how trauma is affecting them personally? Mm -hmm. I love that question because there's a lot of self-awareness and a lot of curiosity in that question, which I think is the first step, right? So some of the ways, um, I mean, I can talk from firsthand experience and then I can say, you know, some of the ways that I've seen this in other people. For me, I had to be in enough pain and I mean that in lots of ways. I don't mean that necessarily physically at all, but I had to be in enough emotional pain to realize there's got to be a better way, right? So at the point where I started really dialing in and, and digging into this work, I was 36. I was a business owner for 14 years up to that point. So I started my company when I was very young and I was right at the point of selling the company which most people would say, wow, that's a really, you know, great achievement. You must have been so happy. It was a nightmare for me because I was, my identity was so wrapped up in the CEO title. I did not know who I was outside of that. Mm -hmm. And so having that company sold and essentially owned and operated by a different person left me without a team, without an identity. I was I sort of think about it like really hitting rock bottom, but that also led to a bit of a spiritual awakening or some, some kind of awakening where I was like, mm, this isn't, this isn't it. My marriage was failing. I had tacked on about 40 pounds over the course of those 14 years. So health wise, I wasn't feeling my best and my relationships other than my marriage were also suffering I did not feel comfortable in my own body, in my own skin, in my own mind. And it was like, man, this is not sustainable. It's not sustainable. I just had what everyone really wants. A, a great marriage, a successful company, you know, a beautiful home, like all the things. And I was more unhappy than any time I'd ever been. So I couldn't keep going that way. Yeah. And it was at that point that I really dove into that. Um, I think in general, people have to be in a lot of pain, you know, all the ways in order to actually do something about it. But they, they and that applies to so many different things. Yeah. Yeah. But they typically can recognize, even if it's not internal, they can recognize externally when it might be time to do some work when they see a pattern right? Maybe there are a lot of friends who all of a sudden are sort of doing the, the slow fade and ghosting because they don't really want to be around you. Mm. Maybe there's, you know, relationship issues with your children, your spouse, um, other people, maybe colleagues, right? If it's like, wait a minute, maybe I'm the common denominator. 
maybe I'm a little bit of the dumpster fire here, right? If that is at all within your awareness, it's like, okay, now I can work with that because it just takes that little shift of it's not everyone else. It's not the blame shame game. It's like, wait, what's my responsibility here? Is there a way in which I'm contributing to all of the things that are, I have just noticed are happening, oh even if I've never noticed them before, right? Yes, so good. Okay. And it's like, on the one hand, a lot of times, especially the childhood trauma that you're talking about is it's something that happened to you that you, that you are kind of a victim in a sense, um, mm-hmm. to that, uh, whatever somebody did. Um, and so it, I can see how it's complicated to then own the impact that the unprocessed trauma is now having on every, everything else. So let me drop in an analogy here. Be great. Because I think it'll be really helpful. When you're walking on the sidewalk and you see a piece of trash, if you care about the environment, what do you do? You pick it up. Did you throw that piece of trash on the ground? No. So it's not your fault, Mm -hmm. right? You didn't ask for that piece of trash to be on the ground. You didn't invite it, but you're going to clean it up because it's really your responsibility as let's say a global citizen because you know that that it's not fair to the environment to have to deal with that trash yeah it's not fair for other people to have to walk over it or right maybe slip on it so i think about it in the same way trauma is not something that we consented to it's not something that we asked for or invited but it is our responsibility to integrate it Mm -hmm. right because we can't get rid of it it already happened it's yeah. inside of our bodies, right? The the emotional experience, the psychological experiences inside of our bodies. So if it's already there, are you going to keep walking by it or are you going to clean it up? And this is what's so fascinating is that it's almost like it's either going to drive you or you can do something about it and have agency and do something about it. It's already driving you. Yeah. It might just be unconscious or subconscious. Right. You don't realize it. Yeah. So it's like taking more control, taking more, not just responsibility, but also like, yeah, owning it. Yeah. Ownership. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, okay. I feel like that the next question is is naturally, so what do they, what does the person do? You get to that point and you're like, oh, I I think I should do something. (laughs) What do I do besides read the book? Cause that seems like the, the most natural answer for me to give right now. That's a, it's a good start, but it's not the only thing to do Um, inside of the book. uh, So I had overwritten this book by 12,000 words and my developmental editor, who is lovely said, I think you need to take this whole section and make it into its own like website, which actually became myhealingmenu.com. And so that supplement to the book is, I don't know of, I mean, there may be other resources like this out there. I don't know of any, I didn't see any, I didn't find any. But it's essentially dozens and dozens of different tools, practices, modalities, books, podcasts, like plant medicines, all these different things that you have available to you, but that are probably brand new, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There were things that when I was researching for the book and then obviously took out for the website, um, there were things that I had never heard of before. Right. So all it is, there's nothing for sale on it. It's literally just an educational resource to say, if you're wondering where to start, or you're curious about something that's in that healing, you know, trauma integration and healing realm, Mm -hmm. it might be on this website. There might be some information about it. It's really, like I said, an educational resource, but then the beauty of it is people can come and if they've experienced that particular modality, they can comment and share their own experience. Mm -hmm. So yes, you're getting a little bit of information, like just a definition of what is this thing. Um, But other people's experiences below that, I think is where, you know, the magic will be. And again, this book came out just about a month ago. So there are a handful of comments there and I'm encouraging more and more people to share. Mm -hmm. That would be super helpful. Um, Okay. So 
this obviously impacts people at work. It impacts computers. <laughs> I know that that's kind of the, I, my understanding is that that's kind of the, the target demographic for the book. I mean, it depends on how you define a leader, right? Uh, we can absolutely be leaders in our family units. Um, mm -hmm. We can be leaders in our social groups, our, if we're part of spiritual or religious affiliations, um, and of course, our organization. So, yes, I say emerging and established leaders is who the book is for, but really anyone who identifies as a leader in any way can benefit from it. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, so, um, Let's say, um, you know, leaders or, or, um, managers, supervisors, that sort of thing. They're, we mm -hmm. aren't therapists, but we can be trauma informed. Explain that statement. So I think that there's a lot of misconception with the word trauma informed, right? There's trauma aware, trauma informed and trauma responsive. Trauma informed basically just means that you have the training and the understanding as to how trauma impacts people's behavior. You understand what trauma is, you understand how that might manifest. And so in, but the myth here or the misnomer is that as a trauma informed leader or manager or director, you have to be a counselor. You have to be a therapist. You have to sit there and unpack people's, you know, personal lives that it, there's nothing further from the truth. So you're not doing any of that. What you're actually doing is you're looking at and engaging with your employees or reports as a human. That's really what it means. It means like, oh, you have some emotion. Imagine <laughs> oh, that. You, you've had some experiences. And instead of looking at and engaging with someone and thinking about them, what's wrong with them? We're looking at them through a lens of, hmm, I wonder what happened to you right? Yeah. That is the baseline. And then what we're doing from a practical standpoint, not that that's not practical, is we're holding supportive space for them. We're asking really good questions. We are treating them as if they are the subject matter experts of their own lives, that they're whole and complete and valuable, nothing to be fixed. They're not broken. And they just need some support. So in our role as their supervisor or director, we're going to do whatever is within our organizational and, and human capacity to support them. Hmm. That's it. It's treating people like humans if we want to, you know, call it for what it really is. And people really rail against this. Oh, I don't want to be like trauma informed leadership. It's like, oh, um, but but to me, it's like if it's about not feeling like you're out of your depth, right? Because with this training comes a lot of information so that you can help people as they are processing some experience that they might have, or maybe they're feeling overwhelmed in their job. And, you know, otherwise, what are you going to sit there if you don't have, you know, trauma informed training, you'd sit there and be like, I don't know what to tell you, or like, maybe you need a day off. Maybe you should have a bath tonight and a glass of wine. Like you're not giving them sound advice. So it almost feels to me like if you're in a leadership role, being trauma informed and being trained as trauma informed feels like a really great idea <laughs> so that yeah. you can give people sound advice, what does not it take? advice, but coaching, you know? Yeah. What does it take to become trauma informed? Well, for me, I mean, I became certified uh, specifically as a trauma-informed leadership coach mm -hmm. so that I could coach other leaders on how to do this. I mean, I'm coaching them on their own experiences, but then also, you know, just from a modeling standpoint, they're seeing how we engage, how we interact, the questions that I'm asking, how I'm holding that space with them. And that also becomes sort of a, a model for how they can do that with their employees or, you know, direct reports. Um, but there are trainings available. I mean, when I went through my certification, there were only 200 trauma-informed leadership coaches certified globally. So it was pretty early on in the that modality. Mm. But now there are many, many um, programs. Um, you know, International Coach Federation has one. I went through a program called Moving the Human Spirit out of Canada, which was also ICF accredited. Um, lots of places that certify coaches and lots of places that do leadership development training programs and workshops and things like that. They all have uh, trauma-informed training at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, okay. So one of the things that I know a lot of companies are wrestling with right now is this idea of bringing people back into the workspace, um, from a remote environment. And I bring this up in this conversation because I know that there are some people who just feel more comfortable and safe in a remote environment in their own homes or that sort of thing. And it seems like, um, understanding that would be helpful. Number one. (laughs) Um, but then also I wonder if we could create better work environments where people weren't feeling like, you know, so triggered, I guess at work, maybe, maybe they'd be more willing to come back. I mean, what are your thoughts on this topic? I mean, I'm definitely not in the camp of forcing people back into anything, especially into environments where, you know, I think what we what we saw through the pandemic and sort of a force to remote was that all of the even though even though we were in the height of like a kind of scary health crisis, right? There were people who many people who felt relief because they yeah. didn't have to enter and re-enter every single workday, these quite toxic environments where they had to mask who they were, right? They couldn't show up as their authentic selves. I know that that phrase gets a, a lot of pushback, um, but but it's true, right? Like I can't be myself inside of these environments. Um, I might also have felt if I was an employee that was forced into an office, I might have felt pretty micromanaged, mm-hmm. might have felt like somebody was kind of looking over my shoulder and making sure I was being productive all the time. Um, that's not great for a nervous system. Like we're we're humans. We're not actually meant to sit in chairs for eight to 10, 12 hours a day. And um, so, yeah, I, I am not a fan of returning to those types of environments. I think if we are going to return to those environments, we should ask people, right? Because they are the subject matter experts of their own lives. We should ask people, we should invite people into whether it's, you know, anecdotal verbal conversations, uh, intakes, or surveys, or just gathering more information to say, what would feel comfortable? What would feel supportive to you? Yes. I, you know, and I can guarantee like we're no one is ever going back to a forced you know, 100% in office, I think that you're going to lose a lot of employees. It, it, we mm-hmm. saw that very early on, right? Not even or early you're having on. a very small company. Yeah. <laughs> or you're having a very small company, which is fine. Maybe yeah. that you have to give it to have a smaller company, but you're not, it's not going to be sustainable because not everyone is going to feel the same. We all have different nervous systems. We all have different abilities to cope with stressors, right? That's really the definition of trauma. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I just think that inviting other people's um, voices, especially if you are asking people to to re-enter like that, I think you know most people are either fully remote at this point or doing a hybrid schedule where they have to go into the office maybe one, two, or right. three at most days per week. Um, I get that the organizations are paying for these big office spaces, but maybe we need to reimagine that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's, I think that there's just a lot of opportunity for more creativity as opposed to this rigid, you know, it's always been this way, or we have this big office space that we're paying a lease on for 30 years. Well, why did you go into a 30 year lease? Right. Like some of these business practices really need to be looked at from, you know, a fiscal standpoint. They were not good decisions. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, we had the pandemic to really highlight that. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but yeah, no, I, I, I just thought it would be fun to talk about that yeah. subject because it's so relevant to what you're talking about and what companies are really wrestling with on that kind of bigger strategic level and how this is still so important. Um, yeah, you know, you, you also, I know like your, um, in my healing menu.com, I know some of the things that you have on there are somatic um, modalities, things that people can actually do to, uh, with their physical bodies Mm -hmm. to help them. Um, so I, can you, can maybe explain that first of all, and then Mm -hmm. also tie that back to what we can do in our work environments to make space for that. Yeah, sure. 
So somatics, literally just meaning movement, right? I mentioned before that trauma lives in our bodies. It resides in our bodies. It's stored or trapped in our bodies. So if we want to release it, right, which is part of the integration process, then somatic work is just necessary. It's the very reason why being in talk therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy for years and years and years, why it doesn't feel like it works Mm -hmm. or why you feel like you have to go for years and years and years, because you're not doing anything somatic. Now there are somatic trained and trauma-informed therapists these days. So you could look for someone who does that. My own therapist, we um, do our therapy sessions outside. And so we're walking while we're talking, right? Something simple like that. As I'm bringing up and talking about something maybe very emotional or um, something that was a traumatic experience, I'm also moving my body. So it's like bringing it up and Mm. releasing it out. Mm. Again, super simple. But what we can do in the workplace, because the workplace is full of activating experiences, Um, lots of things that can be done. You can go for a walk during your lunch break or during your breaks if you have those scheduled during the day. If you don't have those scheduled the day, there's no problem. Like get up and whether you're working from home or in an office, get up, move your body, right? Maybe there's, um, I don't know a restorative or some kind of lighter, um, more accessible yoga program Mm -hmm. that can be done during the middle of the day, like on your lunch hour. Um, Even just stretching, right? Just sitting at your desk and like stretching and kind of being, taking some like intentional time. Um, Even though it's not movement, it's also a grounding practice to let's say remove your socks and shoes Put your feet flat on the floor and just notice when you, if you feel comfortable closing your eyes, notice what kind of energy, what kind of sensation is at the bottoms of your feet. That's actually the, the energy in your body, the chi in, in um, Chinese or, or Asian medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. That's the life force moving through your body. It's there all the time. But because we are constantly moving and not paying attention to our bodies, which gets us in a lot of trouble, um, we don't notice it. And so just bringing some awareness to that, maybe closing your eyes, maybe doing some um, some breath work, which is nothing, you know, difficult. Mm. It's just breathing in. Maybe you can do some box breathing, breathing in for an account of four, holding at the top for a count of four, breathing out for a count of four. And then again, pausing at the bottom of the breath, a count of four, and just doing that box breath. Yeah. These are not difficult. They certainly don't cost any money. They're not inter- interrupting anything. They're not interrupting anything. Um, again, if you're in the office, some of these things are a little bit more accessible. If you're at home, you can do you know, any of them. Yeah. If you're at home, you have access to a much wider range, right? But in the moment, you know, even something like squeezing your fists or your your muscles of your arms and legs and then releasing it, right? Just getting that blood flow. Yeah. That's yeah. also really helpful. Again, these are very simple. And in our society, we tend to downplay or minimize the efficacy of things that are simplistic <laughs> when in fact they are incredibly effective. Oh my gosh, I feel like you need to say that one more time. <laughs> In our society, we downplay or minimize the things that are simplistic. Those are things that are also the most effective and probably the most valuable because they're really accessible to everyone. Oh, so good. I know that um, in the book, you in chapter 12, you talk about boxing. <laughs> how did you get into that? What is the significance of that story and how does it connect with what we're saying right oh, now? Oh, wow. Okay. So yes, somatics. One of the, the ways in which I used somatic emotional release was through boxing. And the story that you're talking about in chapter 12 was a good friend of mine had been um, a martial arts trainer and boxer in Ireland. His name is Ronan. And um, we were talking about being bullied or something when we were younger. And then he was sharing a story about, you know, some uh, um, boxing 
um, on an aqua bag, which is basically like a heavy bag at the gym, but filled with water, right? So mm -hmm. it, it kind of bounces back at you a little differently. And I just like the, um, the sensation in my body when he was sharing this, I just felt so much resistance. And I was like, oh my God, I could never do that. He's like, why? I said, cause I couldn't imagine hitting anything. Mm -hmm. And he was like, hmm, that's interesting. Say more about that. So we continued the conversation and he's like, this is exactly why I think you should do this. And I was like, no way. Finally, after, I don't know, another hour, he convinced me. He said, let me train you. I was like, so I'm going to hit a heavy bag. Like I'm going to have boxing gloves on and hit a, even an inanimate object. That was too, that was so much for my nervous system to think about because I was on the receiving end of physical abuse for six, the first 16 years of my life. Mm -hmm. So the idea of hitting a heavy bag in my mind made me like my abuser. Mm -hmm. That's why I had so much resistance to it. And so what he did was very trauma informed. And I'll say mm -hmm. it like that because I just want to, you know, explain how that looks practically. So he went very slow with me. We worked on footwork, we worked on conditioning. So I was jumping rope, not, not happy about it, but jumping rope and running and, you know, doing all these things. We worked on form. I had the gloves on. He showed me how to like, you know, have the position of the gloves near my face. And we didn't really hit anything for probably the first, I don't know, month or two, which was kind of frustrating for me. I'm like, if I'm here, <laughs> then like, let's get to it. Um, but he was very slow and methodical. And, you know, finally he trained me and then COVID hit maybe a few months later. And so I ended up getting a heavy bag, ordering one, hanging it up in my garage. And um, yeah, just doing that as a practice felt really good. But one day I had just gone out into the garage for whatever reason, this particular day, I didn't have any music on, which was an anomaly because I always had music on. And I just unleashed on this heavy bag and what I noticed was or in retrospect what was happening was all of this pent-up anger and emotion and rage was surfacing itself for the first time it was like the first time that I let myself feel safe enough or comfortable enough to be angry at mm. my mother for so much abuse. And so I was essentially taking that rage out on this heavy bag, right? Which was kind of my worst nightmare, if you think about the beginning of the story. But it was so cathartic for me. Um, and also really activating because I did not, after that day, I didn't hit the heavy bag for three years after that. Hmm. I have returned back to yeah. boxing yeah. And, and that, and I love it, but it can be overwhelming. And so that's part of the integration process of trauma healing is you have to take the time that you need. Mm -hmm. And if it's three weeks or three months or three years, there's no judgment about that. So I was very gentle with myself. I did other things from a somatic standpoint uh -huh. um, instead of boxing. So when you, I, that's such a great story um, to share. Thank you so much for sharing it. But um, I'm also sure. wondering, like, as you were doing that, or after you did that, had this um, cathartic experience, mm -hmm. what kind of impact did that have on you as you were living your life and in, in around that time? Did you notice a difference of any kind? Did you, were you, you know, what was going on? Yeah, I, I think I had access to other emotions. Oh, so interesting. Um, you know, when we bury, when we repress any emotion, we're not just burying or repressing that emotion, right? I was burying and repressing anger and rage, mm. which are just normal human emotions mm. in our society. Again, those are not safe emotions to have, right? What do we do with a, a young child when they start to have a tantrum or they have some, you know, angry reaction, right? It's like, go sit down, don't do that. We tell them that it's bad, that we tell them that anger is not something that they're able to, or that's acceptable, right? So it's a natural human emotion and being able to express anger in a healthy way is part of how you become a healthy human, right? So anyway, I was repressing 
that anger, which means that I was also repressing other things like joy. Yes. So as the anger was had like an outlet, now I was able to feel joy for the first time, like real joy. Having access to joy as like me <laughs> felt like, wow, this, this feels really good to me. This feels like who I actually am. Yeah. And then, you know, some more dots start to get connected. It's like, wow, if I strip away all of these stories and coping mechanisms and survival strategies, like who I am at the core is actually quite a joyful person. But I didn't have access to that for a very, very long time, like 40 years. So I feel like, yeah, in the last four, I'm 44 now. So in the last four years of my life, it's been incredibly joyful. No. You know, even though the hard things happen, you know, sure. life, life is life. And this year in particular has been really difficult. Mm -hmm. But even through that, it's like, I can definitely find moments of joy and have access to a whole nother level of emotion and uh, experience than I've ever had before. Oh, that's just such a beautiful story. I'm so, so thankful that you told, shared, shared that with us. I've never actually shared all of that. So thank you for asking. Oh, gosh, I love it. Um, well, it's really inspiring. So you should share it more. <laughs> if you haven't <laughs> ever done that before, do it. <laughs> oh, golly. Um, okay. Um, I feel like, I feel like, I feel like it was like, like this great way to end the conversation too. <laughs> so I want to ask another question, a, a couple more questions. I've got three, sure. three more questions. Next sure. question. <laughs> um, uh, is there anything else about the book that you just really would like to make sure to ding on the end here? I think the relationship, like why you do the healing work, right? Like, okay. yes, of course it's for you. Of course it's for you. Yeah especially if you're in a lot of pain, like you want relief from that. Yeah. But we are more likely to do the work if it's coming from an altruistic place, meaning we're doing it for someone else. That's just human nature mm -hmm. for, for most of us. Um. So yes, you're doing it for you, but there are so many other beings who benefit from it, right? So other people in your life, other more than human kin that benefit um, the earth benefits right because as you heal all of a sudden most people not everyone but most people feel this kind of inexplicable connection to nature or reconnection to nature interesting right so you're now all of a sudden feeling more uh, or less separation from natural you know, plant life, animal life, things like that. That happened for me. You know, I was never into, I mean, I always loved nature in general, but like I was never into having a ton of, you know, plants in my house and, and things like that. And now I have like 80 and it feels really good to be able to tend to them. Hmm. I have a vegetable garden. I grow my own food. I have a rain garden that I just planted irises in actually blue flag in particular, because in the area where I live, that's a native plant that's um, not very, um, I don't think it's an endangered species, but it, it's not very um, populated and it's very beneficial for the environment. So I just recently went out and specifically bought that and put that in the rain garden. These feel like very important things to me. Hmm. My relationship to nature and my tending to and cultivating of the natural world feels more important to me than it ever has before because I don't see myself as separate from these things I'm just part of right so I don't know that's my experience maybe that's not everyone's experience um, and maybe it takes a longer time for other people to get there or a shorter time right these are non-linear paths everyone's journey looks different hmm. oh yeah I love that okay so where can people find you and your book Everything's really just available on my website, which is klcampbell.com. And then we mentioned before myhealingmenu.com, which is obviously a separate site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Last question for you. This is the Voice of Influence podcast. What last piece of advice would you want to give somebody who would like to have a Voice of Influence? Mm. 
someone who wants to have a voice of influence first needs to have a voice. And that voice is already inside of you. It's just that there are these layers of accumulated silt that other people stacked on that you don't need anymore. So I think in order to have a voice of influence, you have to kind of un undo all of those layers, clean those up, and then you get to have the voice that you've always wanted, maybe that you didn't even know was inside of you, but I can promise you it's there. And, you know, once you gain access to it, then you can actually use that as a platform to benefit other people, because that's also something that's going to naturally arise. You're going to want to do that. Hmm. Great word. Thank you so much. This has been such a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. Thanks, Andrew. It was my pleasure.